and that he was a jazz musician. Now that was an extraordinary thing for the neighborhood, for the, for the, for the Bedford Stuyvesant in which I grew up, because it was a neighborhood comprised of an interesting mix. There were African Americans from the Deep South who would come north uh, under the Great Migration North during that whole period. People with very much the immigrant mentality. They had come north to make it, to find themselves a good job, and to acquire maybe a little property and so on. Uh, there was also part of that community, the West Indians who would come in. In fact, <clears throat> I always thought of the West Indians as the West Indian wing of the Great Migration North the two of them together. And so it was a community that was all about making it. And the way you made it was to acquire a house, a little piece of property, or if you could, a little small business on Fulton Street. <clears throat> and you had ambitions for your children. And those ambitions were spelled out in, um, first of all, that you wanted to produce at least a lawyer. Mm -hmm or a doctor, or at least, if nothing else, a school teacher. Mm -hmm. But certainly no artists. I mean, they didn't understand artists. What was that all about? You couldn't make a living being an artist. So when I heard that this cousin of mine, this Sonny, that I never met, was a jazz musician playing the baritone sax, I thought of him as a very brave person. He must have been a very brave person to sort of defy the mores of that community and insist upon playing jazz. Um, that was the first thing I learned about him. The second thing was that um, before he could get a name for himself in the community as a jazz musician, he was drafted. It was World War II. He was drafted. He went in the army, and he wasn't there no more, it seems, than a month or so in boot camp that he died mysteriously. That was it. Those are the only three things I learned about my cousin Sonny. Played the baritone sax, went in the army, died in boot camp. And I thought about that a lot over the years. This young man just cut off, you know, at his prime, just beginning his career. And it took me a while to come to the place where I said, <clears throat> I'm going to try to invent a life for him, to in some small way make up for the life that he was denied. And so the Fisher King, is that kind of fictitious life that I made for my cousin, my cousin Sonny. So what I did, and I'm, I'm now talking about the process of how books are created, okay? How, how a work of fiction is created. So what I did was to take his name, Sonny, and do a little sort of variation on it. So in the book, his name is Sonny Red Payne. He doesn't play the baritone sax, he plays the piano. And um, he started out as a little boy playing classic piano because that, of course, I mean, in that community, which was so upwardly mobile, hmm, they wanted the children to play the classics. Hmm? It would pain your ear to listen to some of the classics. <laughs> you know, banging away at Bach and Beethoven. Oh. <laughs> but uh, he started out as a classical pianist. Uh, this is my, this is the fictitious Sonny. Um, and his mother approved of that. But then when he was in his teens, walking along Fulton Street, he heard coming out of Burdell's record store <laughs> something that excited him. And he became taken with jazz, with the blues. Uh, and s started switching over. His mother was furious at him, and the community in general, because they thought of him as someone, he was very gifted. 
They thought of him as someone who might one day play in Carnegie Hall. just for who they are, okay? Um, then I, of course, gave him a wife later on, but she happened to be um, the daughter of, um, of someone that Sonny's mother didn't particularly like. So there's that conflict there. They married. I also gave him another woman in his life. She is his road manager and in many ways closer to him than his own wife. Her name is Hattie. Um, he leaves Brooklyn because of all of the pressure at home, because of all of the conflict between the two families, and because of racism. As a musician, what he runs into when he goes on the road, when he's even here in, in New York. He decides to leave the country and like a lot of jazz musicians at the time, this is back in the late 40s and 50s, they went to Paris. He goes to Paris. He has a wonderful career in Paris. Uh, has a child there um, and um, uh, dies there. And um, I also provide him with a little Parisian grandson who is brought to the States to attend a memorial concert for his grandfather. And it is through the eyes of this little eight-year-old Parisian boy who speaks both English and French that the whole story is told. He meets for the first time the American family. And we, through this little boy, begin to understand all of the forces that drove Sonny Red away. So that's kind of the construct of the, of the novel. Um, maybe I'll just read very quickly um, the, um, a scene where the little boy meets one of the relatives for the first time. In fact, he meets the mother of Sonny Red for the first time. Of course, she is his great-grandmother for the little boy. I'll just read a little bit of that. Sure. Okay. said was his great-grandmother, stood eyeing him from behind the locked iron gate to the basement of her brownstone house. She had ordered that he be brought to see her as soon as he arrived in the country, if not the same day, then the one following. In either case, he was to visit her first, she'd, she'd said, before any of the other relatives, and certainly before the old Miss Young, across the street at number 258 Macon. And the visit was to last a full hour. She had insisted on that also. Yet minutes had passed, and she'd made no move to open the gate and let him in. Nor had she spoken as yet, even though Hattie, and this Hattie is the, is, was the, is the sort of ex-girlfriend of, of Sonny Red, uh, even though, and she, is, uh, she has custody of, of the little boy. <clears throat> the little boy whose name is Sonny. Um, even though Hattie, who had brought him over for the visit and was standing waiting behind him, had politely greeted the woman and introduced him when she answered the bell. Hello, Mrs. Payne, it's Hattie, she said. Hattie Carmichael, you might not recognize me, it's been so long, so many years. And this is Sonny, his name's Sonny. Not a word. Her roomy, clouded over eyes, Immediately latching onto his face, the woman hadn't said a word. 
nor had she so much as glanced at Hattie. He waited, puzzled, Hattie behind him, her height and bulk shielding him from the wind that had followed them into the bare front yard of the house. A late March wind that was behaving as if it was still the depths of winter. On the way over, it had buffeted them past the houses lining either side of the street. They were row houses, the like of which he had never seen before, all of them four stories tall, under big cornices, all of them hewn out of a dark reddish-brown stone, and all with high stoops slanting sharply down from the second story to the yard. And then there was this heavy wrought iron basement gate under the side of each stoop, identical to the one rearing up just inches from his face. A dungeon gate with arrowhead bars like spears. He liked it. Liked also the marching houses, castles. Something about them reminded him of the castles and fortresses he was good at drawing. The woman he'd been told was his great-grandmother continued her silent scrutiny of him. For his part, he had already noted as much of her as he cared to from the battered old lady hat on top of her uncombed hair, down to the none too clean house dress to be glimpsed under a long, shapeless cardigan that was as heavy as a coat hanging on her tall and bony frame. The few buttons left on the sweater were all in the wrong holes, and there were food stains on it as well as on the dress. Like a two-year-old, he thought, who didn't know how to dress or feed itself good. Worse, there was the woman's hand. You're not to stare, Hattie was always admonishing him. This time he couldn't help it. There was nothing wrong with the woman's right hand. That was okay. But behind the tall bars of the gate, her left hand kept up a trembly dance at her side. Did he really want someone like her for a relative? Is something wrong, Mrs. Payne, Hattie's voice said? Have you changed your mind, perhaps? Should I maybe bring him back another day? A cut eye. The woman finally acknowledged Hattie's presence with a single venomous cut eye and returned her gaze to his face. It came to Sonny then. The gate wouldn't open, the visit wouldn't take place, so long as Hattie stood drawn up behind him as if waiting to barge into the house the moment he was admitted. She was not, it had been agreed, to be part of the visit. That's another thing the great-grandmother woman had insisted on. He was to be alone with her. All right, Mrs. Payne, said Hattie. I get the message. I'm leaving. But I'll be back for him in an hour, if not before. He's to meet his other great-grandmother this morning, too, you know. She's got as much right to him as anybody else around here. Then bending down to hug him from behind, had he repeated the instructions she had given him earlier. If there was a problem, or he didn't like it, or if anything happened to upset or frighten him, he was to phone her and she'd come get him right away. To prevent the woman from understanding, Hattie had switched from English to French, or what with Hattie passed for French. Terrible. Sonny hadn't realized just how terrible was the scramble make do French Hattie spoke until he started school. Did he have the slip of paper with the number where they were staying in his pocket? Oui, he said. And deeply offended by the cutting look she'd been dealt, Hattie, who was his father, mother, sister, and brother, and all the kin he had ever known, was gone. The moment she turned out of the yard, the woman unlocked the dungeon gate. It took her a while because of the trembling hand. That done, she spoke for the first time, come out the cold, nah? Huh? <laughs> and, it goes, and it goes on. But it's through this little boy mainly, because it's not told uh, exclusively from his point of view, but it's largely through his innocent eyes that this whole world is, is revealed. And uh, one of the things that happens in the novel is that the two grandmothers, two great-grandmothers, who um, have had this feud going on for years, it is the presence of this little boy that over the course of the novel helps them to come to not 
not any kind of reconciliation, but to a measure, a measure of forgiveness. Just a measure, not full scale. But I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the kind of, of uh, healing properties that this little boy brings with him. In fact, someone said to me, because there's this tug of war in the novel uh, over the child. You know, one part of the family wants him, they want to take custody of the other side, and there's Hattie in the middle who adores this child. So someone, when I read this uh, a particular chapter, uh, said to me, you should name the book Eliane. It'll be a bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the whole tug of war that went on over the little Cuban boy. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. <clears throat> Why did you choose the child's perspective? Did it offer you a measure of freedom now and adults' uh, point of view might not? Or is it the other way around? Well, uh, for a number of reasons. Um, I wanted the challenge of seeing if I could write convincingly from a child's perspective. I mean, here I am at my great age, being presumptuous enough, you know, to try to get into the head and into the feelings of, a, of an eight-year-old. And I found that, you know, just a kind of challenge I couldn't resist. And one of the uh, positive things that have been said about the book is that he works as a character. The other thing that I wanted to explore by choosing him as one of the principles in the novel um, is that he is an innocent who comes into the midst of all of this contention and rivalry and conflict. And, and I think it makes it, um, I like to think that uh, because he is so innocent, it really points up the absurdity of the kinds of, of uh, animus, you know, that separates the adults. So that's another reason for choosing him. The other thing I mentioned just a little bit uh, before, um, the whole question of, of love. I wanted to explore what love is all about. Um, do we really sort of, is it, is it, is, is it a kind of innocent, genuine kind of thing, or is it, or is it kind of weighted with all kinds of agendas, personal, selfish agendas that people bring to me? Everybody in the book loves this little boy, but when you examine the love they have for him, you begin to see that it is, in a sense, kind of, um, of tarnished by a lot of selfish considerations. For example, the woman Hattie, who is, who has, who is his custodian, who, who is his guardian at this point. Hattie loves him deeply, but part of that love has to do with the fact that he embodies for her the Sonny Red Payne, who she loved and is no longer there, Sonny Red Payne's wife, who she also loved. They had this interesting, unconventional life together in Paris, the three of them. Uh, so that this little boy expresses, embodies for her what she has lost. And she is so determined to hold on to him that she refuses to let him know about his American relatives. It's only when he is, you know, they, they're, they're let us go out, money goes out to get her to bring him to the States, the only reason she brings him is that it's a concert honoring Sonny McPay. And a good deal of money has been sent to make it possible for her to come. So even though there is this love for the child, you know, it's also kind of, of, of tempered and even tarnished by these other considerations. Um, the grandmothers, the great grandmothers love him. But again, it's because they see in him these children that they lost. So it was a way for me to kind of, of deal with that theme of uh, the whole question of love. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> yes, it does. The thing about this little boy, he's around grown-ups a lot. And so he's come up with ways, and when grown-ups are talking, 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 He's come up with ways to kind of amuse himself. He was given 
a book of castles and fortresses and knights and so on, you know, the King Arthur kinds of things. He is, he is wonderful. He is very good at drawing. He draws castles. So when he's in the company of adults and they're going on and on about stuff he's not, doesn't understand or he's not interested in, he gets out his drawing book and he draws castles. And the Fisher King is a legend that comes from King Arthur of the Round Table which was required reading when I went to PS35 here in Brooklyn. I don't guess it is anymore. <laughs> we, could, we didn't read Zora Neale Hurston. You know, there was no Zora Neale Hurston, no Langston Hughes, no James Weldon Johnson, but they made sure that we read King Arthur of the Round Table. It was strictly a European agenda. So what writers do is you make use of whatever is at hand. I mean, this is the stuff that I had read, and I could see where I could use the Fisher King legend out of the King Arthur tales for my purposes in this novel as a kind of metaphor, because the King Arthur legend has a king who is almost imprisoned in his castle, and he's waiting for someone, and he's wounded. He's wounded. He's waiting for someone to come and release him and to heal him. My little grandson draws his castles and at the bottom of each page in the right hand corner he draws a little knight you might not be able to see it he draws a little knight who stands outside each of his castles inside the castle in this little kid's head is his grandfather who died very tragically he has him in the castle he's healed his art is protected, he is safe. And this little boy is standing out there protecting the Fisher King. So that's where the metaphor comes from. <laughs> it's not the movie, The Fisher King. Somebody asked me the other day, is that the book from the movie, The Fisher King? I said, no, but we both use the same source. <laughs> Stones that went with the houses is not as dominant in this novel because this novel really moves between Paris and Brooklyn. It really goes into a lot about the life that uh, Sonny Red Payne lived in Paris and that the little boy, you know, lives in Paris. And so there's more, there's, it's not solely Brooklyn, in other words, right? But uh, some of the voices, yes. Uh, there is, there's both the African-American voice, because one great-grandmother is African-American, and she imbues this little boy with stories about what it was like growing up in the South. Uh, the other great-grandmother is West Indian, uh, and she too gives her history as a West Indian coming into, into the United States. So, and Sonny, the little boy Sonny, um, and this is another use of him in the novel. He is African American, he is uh, West Indian, and he's African because his father, his father was an African uh, vendor, you know, just selling tourist stuff and so on in Paris. And so what I wanted to do with that was to have him embody the great wings of the diaspora, the black diaspora, he brings them together. He reconciles all of our differences. You know, he brings a kind of healing and unity, which I feel is absolutely important if we're going to move forward as a people. And so this little boy, this little boy, 
embodies that unity in his person. Kind of a lot of weight for him to carry, but he does it. <laughs> patient with myself on one hand. On the other hand, I accept it. You know, I mean, this is my pace. This is my way of working. And uh, even though, yes, I'm a little envious of those writers who can turn out a book, and sometimes a very decent book, in three years, five years, it takes me longer. You know? um, so it's been a while. And as I said, because this book, the idea for it, goes back so far in my personal life, um, you just don't even want to, you don't want to calculate years here. You just, you just want to deal with the fact that it's actually out. <laughs> well, I was thinking about that when you told the story initially, mm -hmm. that the child's voice was way for you to examine what questions you may have had at that time, because you were about the same age. Right? Yes, that's right. When you glanced and saw mm -hmm. uh, your cousin's picture, so this might have been when you examined um, some of the questions. Yeah. Um, that. Absolutely, absolutely, because what it permitted me to do was to really, in a sense, investigate, explore what is the relationship of the artist to his society. Because what I experienced growing up in Bed-Stuy was that artists were sus suspect. You know, when I talked to my mother about being interested in writing, she said, interested in what? <laughs> you know? In fact, I remember her saying, she said, wait a minute, the telephone company has just started hiring Cullen. Would you get down there and apply for a job? <laughs> but a writer, a musician, and yet in the face of that conservative society, there were any number of great jazz musicians who came out of Brooklyn during that period. And there was a very active, you know, kind of musical life. <laughs> I was wondering if you based most of your stories <clears throat> on something that troubled you in your own life. Uh, you said that you found that you uh, sometimes took you a longer time to, to write a book. Is it because a lot of it is based on different little incidents in your life that experience. Um, and I think uh, with me, when I, when I get involved with a novel, I'm really trying to answer questions I'm putting to myself. And my way of finding the answer is to write a novel about it. For example, with the novel Praise Song for the Widow, I wanted to really put the question to myself, what is it like to grow old in a society like America, where by the age 30, you're consigned to the dustbin? You know what I mean? It's such a youth-oriented society. I really wanted to put that question, and, and I had to find the answer by, in a sense, writing the book. Um, and it was a wonderful kind of answer, and I think I was at a stage in my life where that question was important. Hmm? And one of the answers I came up with in writing the book was that at any age, one has the right and the responsibility to reconstitute one's life. Mm -hmm. But I had to go through the process of writing the book to, in a sense, really answer that fully for myself. So yes, there is that. But usually, the only autobiographical aspect of these books is perhaps the emotional content. But I am a storyteller. I make up stuff. It's imagination. It's invention. As Zora Neale Hurston said, I'm a teller of tall lies. <laughs> you know? But they're lies that happen to speak to the truth of the human condition. And that's where the storyteller is. <laughs> yes? 
went all the way back, went all the way back to the kitchen of that brownstone house on Hancock Street where I grew up. My mother and her friends, after they came back from their jobs as housekeepers and domestics and so on, they would sit around the table and they would lay on some talk. Oh, those women could talk. And talk brilliantly. I mean, they didn't just gossip. Yes, they did some gossiping. <clears throat> Who's running with whose wife and so on, yes. But they also talked about the world, what was going on in society. They were interested in politics and in the economy and so on. And they told stories. They told stories. And they were brilliant storytellers. Natural storytellers. They never put any word on paper. You know. And I, as a little girl, was consigned to the kitchen. If I was a boy, I would have been allowed to go out and play on the streets. But I had to stay in the kitchen with them, which was the, the best thing that ever happened to me, even though I hated it at the time, because I absorbed the way that they told stories. And that has stayed with me. That has stayed with me. Um, and so even though I knew I would never be able to tell stories the way they did, just sit around the table, uh, no outline, no agonizing, <laughs> you know, just tell it, and perfect stories. I knew somehow I didn't have that particular gift, but I would have to write it down. So it took me a long time before I actually could be brave enough to, to actually sort of start writing it down. It took me a long time. Do you have to inhabit another place to um, create the language for that? To inhabit the writing. writing? The writing? I mean, when, when you talk about the, the, the language that your mother and your friends used around the table, mm -hmm. it seems to me that's a different language than a language that gets written down. Well, what, what you do, what I, and that was a struggle, that was a challenge. What I tried to do, both in trying to capture the vernacular of the African-American side of me, as well as the West Indian side of me, is to not do it phonetically, you know, try to get the sound on the, on the page and so on, but rather to suggest the vernacular, with a word here and there, a saying perhaps, you know. Um, for instance, the grandmother says, the great-grandmother says, come out the cold nut. That's all I would do with that. I would not say uh, the only change would be um, N-U-H at the end. Come out the cold nut. But I wouldn't make any changes in the rest of it. I just try to suggest it, try to suggest the poetry within the vernacular. But not to do anything. When I see stuff that's phonetically rendered on the page, I get very annoyed because I'm struggling to kind of figure out what, what each individual word is. And that you never want to do in storytelling. You never want the reader to have to stop to figure out what you're trying to say. So I just try to um, suggest the vernacular. The last one. <laughs> this, this book is about a musician. Yes, it is. Uh -huh. So did you steep yourself in music? To write it, did you did music, the rhythm of music inform your meter or your anything? Well, one of the great things that happened to me uh, in my mid-teens, a little, a little late, maybe when I was 17 or yeah, 17, um, my first serious boyfriend um, was uh, a classical pianist. He was one of those little West Indian boys. The mother made sure he was going to go to Carnegie Hall. <laughs> but he loved jazz. He would have loved to play jazz piano, but knew he didn't have that particular gift. Mm -hmm. So he would go to all of the clubs in Brooklyn. There was the Putnam Central Club. I don't know if you remember Putnam Central Club. We would be there every weekend. And they had great musicians from all over coming to Brooklyn, you know. Bud Powell, uh, Lester, uh, uh, Lester Young, you know, um, Charlie Parker. All of these guys came to play in Brooklyn, in Bed-Stuy. 
And I think I absorbed a lot just sitting there in that club, even though I was not um, someone who was, who was into music at all. I absorbed a lot. And the whole world of the, of the musician also. But one of the good things, one of the positive things that's been said of the book is that it seems as if it's been written by someone who knows music. Mm -hmm. I worked hard at that. Another reason why it took so long. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Last question. When you start a novel, where do you start? <sighs> where do I start? I have any number of false starts. I have any number of false starts. Uh, but what I do, I tend to just write whatever comes to my head. Uh, whatever thoughts I have about what I want to do, just get it down on paper. My first draft is almost illegible. Mm -hmm. But it's important for me to have it down there because it's not so terrifying. I can't stand the blank page. If I've got a whole morass of words down there that I've somehow got to plow my way through, that's preferable for me than having to look at the blank page. So I do a lot of thinking on paper. Some other writers, they do a lot of thinking in their head so that when they go to a draft, to that first draft, it's, it's first of all, it's legible, <laughs> you know? And second of all, it's close to almost final, to almost finished form. With me, no. I have to go through any number of drafts before I'm actually ready to show it to my editor. And I don't show it to anybody while I'm working on it. Other writers, they've got lovers, they've got children, they've got, they show everybody. Friends, they call them with every paragraph, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Each writer has his or, and, or her own way of, of going about it. For me, it's a lot of writing, knowing full well that a lot of that stuff I'm putting on paper is going to be consigned to the waste paper basket. Hmm? But I've got to go through that that whole motion, so to speak, that whole process, that whole process. <laughs> well, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Maria Thomas, I knew I wasn't here at the beginning. I was around, um, the chief librarian. And it is indeed our pleasure to have her here and to say also that we'd like you to um, use the table over there and purchase some of the goodies. Fisher King and Paul Marshall, brown gold, brown stones. And that was my first novel that I read about. And you know, to say that, we hope that sometime, this is her second time here with the Black Writers Conference, which is the first time. No, yeah, okay. <laughs> and so we hope that this will not be the last, because it was indeed very interesting and fascinating to see how she brought the novel to fruition. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. If I need the mic? No. <laughs> Thank you.